Welcome back to the Boris Pro Audio Booth here at NAMM 2012 in Anaheim, California. I have a very special gentleman here today sitting in the Boris Booth by the name of Lee Dixon. Let me tell you a little bit about Lee. So Lee Dixon, um, as you may or may not know, he faithfully served for more than 30 years as Eric Clapton's guitar tech and his personal assistant, of course. He presided over an amazing vintage collection of the world's most expensive and famous guitars, including the iconic Stratocasters, Blackie and Brownie. I'm sure you've seen the inside of those a few times. And the Red Cream 335 and the Crasher Caster, just to name a few of them. Uh, Lee has personally worked with just about all of the world's most influential guitarists, including Jeff Beck, George Harrison, B.B. King, Pete Townsend, J.J. Kale, Steve Winwood, Jim Lawson, and many more <laughs> over the past two decades. Among, along with overseeing the stage responsibilities for Eric Clapton during the uh, iconic concerts like Live Aid, the concert for George, Cream at the Royal Albert Hall, the White House, and hundreds more, Lee also worked on every single Eric Clapton album from 1979 through 2009, supporting both guest artists and Eric's band. He also was instrumental in the development of the Eric Clapton signature Martin guitar line, the Eric Clapton signature Fender Stratocasters, as well as several effects pedals, including the famous Crossroads distortion pedal. Uh, he's learned a lot of tone secrets uh, and tech tips from an amazing career spanning 30 years, closely working side by side with the, arguably the world's most famous guitar player. Shortly. When I give this mic up to Lee, you'll recognize an amazing man with an incredible rare insight into the world of rock and roll music royalty and vintage guitars worth millions of dollars. It's our pleasure and my personal honor to introduce you to Lee Dixon. First of all, I'm Lee Dixon's brother. He couldn't be here today, so I'm gonna have to wing it. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today to tell you a few things. Uh, I discovered these guys Barnes Audio, they make the best guitar pots. You know, you look at guitars, you, everyone's got, you know, we buy expensive guitars, we pay a fortune to the guitars and the best pickups and the best wiring and the best kind of frets and the best inlay material. But the pots, you know, they've never really changed. And through a, a buddy of mine in North Carolina who builds his own guitars, he turned me on to Barnes, I met them. And I'm, I'm here today to, uh, to try and tell you a bit about their product. But um, they do an amazing selection of electronic stuff, but if you guys ever having trouble with a scratchy pot, or a pot that doesn't really, that goes, you know, duck dies between one and two, that kind of thing, I'd highly recommend these. And I'm also in the middle of uh, promoting my own guitar pickups. I've got two sets of guitar pickups from a company called Mojo Tone that are available online. But I, I often get asked about, you know, favorite gigs, for instance, you know, favorite experiences, favorite guitars, well, I suppose because I'm, I'm an older guy, I'm still very much a traditionalist, you know, I still love tellies and strats and, and Les Pauls and, you know, Martins and things like that. I'm looking around this thing today and seeing some amazing new instruments, but I've always likened instruments to being like a woman, you know. It's like, let's say you say to me, check that girl, isn't she beautiful? And I think, you know, no way. I do the same thing to you. you know? You've got to, the, the appeal of a guitar is visual, first of all. I think you'll agree, you know. When you see a guitar, some guitars you look at, you just, the color's wrong or it's, you don't want to pick it up. But, to, you know, just like women, you see them and when you're interested, visual, visual things are the, the main appeal. So I've always been a, a sort of a strat, telly kind of guy, I've, I've simple taste in guitars. But a lot of people ask me what my favorite guitars of Eric's were. And the man, let me tell you, had a lot of guitars, you know, over the time, over 30 years. We conducted two big, or I helped conduct two big auctions with Christie's to raise money for his drug rehab. And uh, 2004 and 2007, I think. And there was just millions and millions and millions of dollars. I mean, it was insane, you know, when you're standing watching this, it's a, it's a 57 Strat, which might cost, you know, 30, 40 grand in a vintage dealer. And all of a sudden, these guys are going, 200,000, uh, no, 300,000, 400,000, you know, mind-blowing, the, the money. I'm sure they all regretted it when they woke up the next day, you know, when the euphoria had died down. What did I pay for this? But uh, that was an amazing experience, just um, 
these guitars that I, I treasured all through the years and looked after and taken care of, all of a sudden they're being up for auction and, and because of who it was and, and the way that it was promoted, it was just like a beating frenzy. I mean, there was guys in there with no money going, 150 grand, 160 grand, you know, well, they're gonna have to sell their house to buy this guitar. But there was a lot of wonderful instruments, you know, a lot of great old, beautiful old Martins, pre-World War Martins, and, and the iconic guitars that Jim mentioned, like that black Strat that he played for years, which was made up of three different Strats, really. You know, it was pickups from one, neck from another, body from another. Brownie, which was my favorite Strat, which was a, an old original 58, which is the guitar he did Layla and all that stuff with. When you look at the Layla album, you'll see the, the guitar on the cover. And um, it was a shame to, to, to let them all go, but I always had to remind myself I was merely like a caretaker, a curator, you know, I was, they were never mine, I was just a, a sucker and looked after them and kept them working and stuff like that. So those are questions I get asked a lot, you know, what was your favourite Clapton guitar, what was your favourite Clapton moment? Well, there's been many of those, I mean, to be doing a thing like Live Aid, which was the first really, really massive concert that we ever did, you know, like worldwide on both sides of the Atlantic, keeping it coordinated you know, eight hour time difference, just trying to, the logistics of the thing were mind blowing. Just to do stuff like that, to have been in the White House, to have been in, in the White House and done gigs for President Clinton, that was amazing, you know, just, I come from a town called Glasgow in Scotland, it's a small town, not a lot of people know about it, but uh, to end up, you know, to stand on the, on the, on the lawn of the White House and play, the, the highlight of the gig for me, we all queued up to meet uh, Mr. Clinton, President Clinton, you know, it's just a, hi, Bill Clinton, hi, Bill Clinton, hi. You're going down the line. And I was at the end of the line, obviously. I was the low guy in the totem pole. And as I'm standing there, I see this guy coming out the side of the White House with a dog on the leash, and I'm a big dog person. So it turned out to be Clinton's dog. So I made a beeline for this dog, spoke to the Secret Service guy who let me pet him and stuff, you know, rolling on the grass with him. Turned around, and, and Bill had gone, and I'd missed my slot. So I had a good time with that. Um, Stuff like playing at Buckingham Palace, you know, that was another one for the Queen's uh, Jubilee. That was an amazing experience, you know, when you've got, I don't know how you guys feel about royalty over here, but you have the, the Queen of England, you know, and all the, all the royals all there, just to, to be in their place, to be in there. I've driven around London all my life, and you drive around Buckingham Palace, this giant walled in place, and to be in there, you know, and see them all. And to watch the Queen putting in her earplugs, it was really, really beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, to lift up the tiara just to get the earplugs in. No, she was very, very, very... Uh, they seemed to enjoy it. There was a mass variety of that. But, you know, I've done all the touring stuff and all the recording stuff. And, uh, and as Jim said, when, you know, we'd be in the studio. It would only ever be me. So whoever the bass player was, Pino Palladino, Duck Dunn, Nathan East, whoever, you know, I'd look after them, whoever the other guitar player was. Or if we were doing an album with B.B. King, you know, I'd take care of B.B. So... Through that, I just I got to work with such an amazing selection of guitar players, musicians, and I did some other things. You know, I, I did do occasional jobs for Pete Townsend when he, you know, his guitar tech wasn't available, and we needed someone for a TV show or something. And I did a great uh, one of my favourite things I ever did, and that wasn't an Eric story. Was I was asked to look after John Entwistle, who was the Who's bass player, for two weeks doing a show called Quadrophenia at Madison Square Garden in New York. And that was an amazing experience, you know, just being a bass tech for a change and not looking after the star, just being off to the side. But a full show with a narration and all the film clips from the movie, it was just a wonderful experience. Another great thing I did. Um, so I've been very, very blessed in my life, you know, and now I'm looking to take, change direction, you know, I'm going to bring out some products with this company, Mojo Tone, my own pickups and stuff. I'm going to be doing some voice work, I'm going to get into a lot of different things. And I've always wanted to work with uh, like a country act, you know, like I've always loved, and I love a lot of these new country acts, you know, like Lady Antebellum and uh, Rascal Flats and all these kind of people, Montgomery Gentry, new to me that is, you know, since I moved out to Kentucky. And hopefully, you know, maybe I'll get, my next job will be in uh, Nashville and, and I'll get to work for some of these guys that treat you right, you know. That's another story. And one of the, the great things about my job was to, uh, was to meet all of my musical heroes, you know, which was a lot of guys, you know, that, I mean, I did tours of Muddy Waters, you know, I was Muddy Waters lighting designer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to work with some of the blues greats, Albert Collins, BB, Muddy, Buddy Guy, 
just to work with all those guys all through my boss my old boss was a, an amazing experience to meet you know George Harrison and Ringo and people like that guys that you know I'd been in awe of when I was a kid and just to find out that they're at the end of they're really nice people you know that when you see these guys out with their stage persona or out with the band they're really sweet people you know really really nice to get on with I mean they're multi-millionaires but they they're natural they're, they're the grounded you know so I've, I've got to meet pretty much everyone that I wanted to meet and work with most of the guitar players and, and drummers and bass players that I wanted to work with and uh, Eric and I came to an end at the end of 2009 and you know George Harrison once said all things must pass and that it includes everything you know in life and I just when you're doing something for 30 years and you dedicate your life to it it's kind of difficult to accept that it's over you know but I had to and, and now it gives me the chance to come to NAMM and, and talk to this massive audience can you keep it down at the back there? A guitar that's been Fender's biggest ever seller was the Eric Clapton model signature strap, which I helped develop and design a little bit, you know, put the finishing touches to. And, uh, and they've, they, out of all the signature series guitars that Fender do, Clapton outsells them all, which has uh, always made me feel good because I contributed something to that. As you probably know, Clapton did several models over the years of, of Martin, you know, with uh, maybe nine or ten different models, I mean it's ridiculous, just all the, the one of the kinds and the black ones and the white ones, but always generally the triple O 28 body size which he, he favoured. So um, I'm here, as I said, to you know help these guys out, not that they need much help, it's the best stuff, you know, any, any change of pots, any kind of electronic stuff, talk to these guys, they'll tell you everything you want to know, but I know for a fact, having you know, having had lots of problems with guitar pots over the years on old guitars, you might not necessarily want to put these into like a, a vintage instrument, into a, a 58 or 59 Les Paul, unless, you know, purely for the monetary, keep it original, but as far as doing the job, I don't think there's a better guitar pot out there than these, and, and they're just so smooth, and they have, one of the great things I loved is that they have a, different torques, you know, you can, uh, you can get them where they're, they're kind of, if you like it stiff, if you don't like your knob too loose, if you excuse the expression, ladies. Uh, you know, you can get them, just, they're just great, man, and I would advise anyone that's thinking of upgrading the guitar or making their own guitar to start there, put those boys in. They're really, really good. <laughs>